Uh, there's George popping back in. And uh, Greg stepped out for me. Oh, there's Greg, Greg coming back right now. So we are recording. That's good to go. All right. So, hello. I am David Kyle Johnson. I am the editor of, I can point, I can't point right. I don't know. There we go. I am the editor of Black Mirror and Philosophy, uh, Dark Reflections. Uh, and this is the panel discussion on it. There's a copy right there. Um, this is the panel discussion on Black Mirror as Philosophy. It's just an academic panel discussion. Uh, joining me uh, are uh, uh, authors uh, that contributed to the book. Um, not all the authors that contributed to the book. There are about 50 people that contributed in total. Um, uh, but a few of them, uh, Claire Ben, who uh, wrote on Playtest, and Bertha Manninen, who wrote on Men Against Fire. Uh, Robert, Play, uh, Robert Price, who wrote uh, a chapter at the end of the book that's on a specific episode, but is about the general theme of love in the entire series. And David Kamez, who also wrote a, uh, a, a series chapter at the end of the book on conscious technology. Uh, there's George Dunn, who, who wrote uh, on uh, Rachel Jack and Ashley 2, which is the latest episode of Black Mirror. And Greg Littman, who wrote on the Waldo moment. Um, and I co-authored, I didn't actually write a single chapter in the book, but I co-authored uh, the Bandersnatch chapter uh, and also contributed just a little bit uh, uh, to, to David's chapter on artificial intelligence. Uh, he did the lion's share of the work, trust me. Um, and uh, so what we'd like to do here is uh, I'm going to uh, uh, mention each person by name again, have them introduce themselves, uh, their uh, affiliation, their specializations. Uh, they can talk a little bit about their chapter if they'd like to, otherwise we can leave that for later. And then I'm just gonna open it up for questions uh, uh, from the attendees uh, to see what we wanna talk about in terms of Black Mirror. So let's start with uh, Claire. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your affiliation and uh, your specializations. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so yes, I'm Claire Ben. Uh, I am a postdoc researcher at the Australian National University. Um, it's very early here. Um, and uh, my specialization is in ethics, both normative theory and applied. And my applied work focuses mainly on virtual reality and AI. Great, and let's hear from Bertha next. Hi, my name is Bertha alvarez Madden. I am a, a, a professor of philosophy at Arizona State University. And my areas are also applied ethics, bioethics, philosophy of religion, and philosophy in film. And I wrote on uh, uh, Men Against Fire and how it contributes to the dehumanization of the other. And I explored some uh, contemporary examples of dehumanization that uh, is equivalent to what the mass implant was for for the characters on the show on the episode great that's i love that chapter doing it in class when i do my teach the, when i teach the the course that chapter always strikes a nerve it is really really good people students really really take to it so so thank well. you um robert please go next hello everybody uh, my name is robert price i'm a uh, uh uh, a lecturer in the professional writing and communication program at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Uh, there's a room full of philosophers here. I am uh, not trained in that respect. I just have an intense interest in these issues. Um, my specialties are more uh, in the pedagogical angle, um, uh, how, to, how to teach people to, uh, to read and write. And I wrote, uh, as, as Kyle said, a, a kind of a series chapter on on love uh, how does the show uh deal with the question of love and, and evil great uh, let's do uh david next uh hello uh, my name is david Gomez. um i'm a senior lecturer at middlesex university in the uk um so i mainly teach uh computer science but i've also you know my research is pretty interdisciplinary so mainly you know, I've done a lot of work on machine consciousness, artificial consciousness, currently working on new way of measuring artificial intelligence, that kind of stuff. Um, and my chapter is all about, you know, the many sort of places in Black Mirror where you get discussions of sort of artificial consciousness appearing and the different ways they appear and whether they are actually going to be possible in the real world or not. Kind of. Great. And uh, George, I'm sorry, let's, let's go. Yeah, George is there. George came up. George, you good? Let's, let's, do, let's go to Greg and then we'll go to George. So Greg, go ahead, then we'll go back to George. I'm uh, Greg Lippman from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, specializing in uh, 
metaphysics, philosophy of logic, and uh, I also write a lot of public philosophy, like, uh, like a few of you. Um, my chapter is on uh, focusing on the episode, The Waldo Moment, and the philosophical question I'm addressing is, what is the appropriate role, if any, of disrespect in politics? I think a, a particularly timely issue at this point. Absolutely. Like I, like I was saying before, my students, one of the things that they said, it's the one of the most prescient, like uh, it really deals with the real world, uh, that, <laughs> that, that, particular, uh, that particular chapter, uh, which of course is ironic because a lot, of, a lot of the people, a lot of people say that's the worst episode, or at least said that was the worst episode of Black Mirror because it's too unrealistic. Uh, yes. and, and now it is the most realistic of all of them, I think. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, George, uh, tell us uh, who you are, what your specializations are, where you're at, uh, and you can tell, say a little bit about your chapter if you'd like as well. Okay, um, I'm George Dunn. I am a research fellow at the uh, Center for Globalizing Civilization at um, Zhejiang University in uh, Hangzhou, China. I'm, I'm not in China right now though, haven't been in China for a while, uh, but that's, that's my affiliation. Um, I, um, um, do research in um, mimetic theory, René Girard, um, history of philosophy, um, Nietzsche, and uh, my chapter is on, um, well, the title of my chapter is, what is it? Something about Miley Two, not Miley Two, <laughs> Ashley Two. Yeah, it's Ashley. Rachel <laughs> Jack, Rachel Jack, and Ashley Two. <laughs> and Ashley Two, um, starring um, uh, Miley Cyrus. Um, everybody's favorite pop star. And the question that I address in that chapter, which has to do with um, empathy and um, emulation, um, and the question of whether a robot uh, can be a friend, um, uh, more, more particularly whether a robot can be the kind of friend that we think it would be desirable to have. Right. Yep, good. So, um, so we have a, a wide range of topics, a wide range, wide range of expertise here on the panel. Uh, and so what I'd really like to do is just open it up. Uh, I have the chat open. And so if you, if you want to say that you have a question, uh, you can do it there or you can uh, raise your hand uh, uh, or give a thumbs up or whatever. And hopefully I, can, I will uh, hone in on it. Um, but if you have a question, please ask uh, me and I will direct it to uh, uh, or just kind of open it up for a uh, uh, discussion. So does anyone in the audience have a question for the panel? Okay, I'm not seeing anything to start. Out. Okay, there we go. Jim's got a question. Go for it, Jim. I always seem to be the first one who'll jump in. But, um, but actually, this kind of continues on something we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, this question about the, the, in my words, the slippery slope of how we treat um, fictional or fictitious or, or virtual people. And does that A, uh, translate into how we treat real people and B, affect our, you know, something in ourselves. Uh, someone I respect, a guy named uh, Dave Grossman, wrote a book called Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. Um, and it was a critique of video games. And I confess, I have not read that book, but maybe some of you have heard of it. And so, you know, that brings up that whole issue. And I just thought maybe uh, some, some of the panelists would have some thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, who wants to, who would like to weigh in? Well, I'm, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, now, the, the question is, um, so the, the way that we treat virtual people, um, does, it, does, it, does it affect the way that we treat real people or could it affect the way that we treat real people? And, and in a way, that's one of the topics that I try to address in my chapter. So um, um, and Rachel Jack and Ashley too, we have this, this robot, it's a social robot who's designed to interact with, with human beings and to behave in a way that will elicit interactions, that will elicit things like empathy, right? Um, and, and this robot, Ashley, too, is designed in such a way that she will be something like the, like the perfect friend for 
you know, for a young teenage girl. Um, so she always listens, she's always there, she's always sympathetic, she always offers encouragement. Um, and, you know, when, when you get tired of having her around, you just say, Ashley, go to sleep, right? And she shuts her eyes and you don't have to deal with her, you know, until, in, until you're ready for more social interaction. Um, so the question that I ask in my chapter is, you know, can a robot like that be a friend? And in some ways, um, Ashley too would seem to be, be the perfect friend. Who wouldn't want a friend who, who is always encouraging, who never complains, who never has, has an unkind word for you, who is always encouraging all of that stuff. The problem is that that does not reflect what, at least what, what someone like Aristotle would think is, is the role of a friend. So the role of a friend is that, that is, that is a true friend, what Aristotle would call a perfect or a complete friendship is not just about pleasure, you know, um, um, you know doing, you know, having fun with the person. And it's not just about utility, rendering various services to the person, but it's about the two friends helping each other to become their very best. And the problem with a social robot like Ashley too, is that she's, she's completely incapable of doing that. And in part, because one of the things that you, can, that you will never be able to cultivate in a friendship with a robot like Ashley are the social virtues. Because the social virtues, and I, I, I deal with this a little bit at the end of my chapter, the social virtues always involved in some way making room for others, right? Um, the, the, the social virtues are, are virtues that involve in some sense taming our natural egotism, right? So that others can have space. Um, and since Ashley is, is, is compliant in every way, or Ashley too is compliant in every way, does whatever Rachel wants her to do, um, um, Ashley essentially, you know, tr trains Rachel to be more egocentric than she would be otherwise. And so, you know, so, so the, when we ask the question, well, you know, does uh, how we treat virtual, pe virtual people, does, can it affect the way we treat real people? You know, I think, you know, generally what, what lies behind the question is concern that, well, if we mistreat, you know, virtual people, then we will, you know, that, 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 you know, that could be the seed of certain vices and end up, we end up treating mistreating real people in the same way. Right? Um, but, you know, in, in the case of Ashley too, the problem isn't that you become vicious because you mistreat her. The problem is that you don't develop the virtues that would make it possible for you to have genuine friendships in relationship with a robot like her. So anyway, so that's, I'll cut myself off at this point. That's, that, that's my thoughts on the subject. Yeah, I feel like, uh, uh, oh, go ahead, go, Claire, please. Uh, I was going to say, one of the things I really love about, um, the, about Black Mirror is that it highlights kind of the different kinds of relationships, what well, the different uh, kinds of virtual entities there are. So when we ask this question about what is the ethical status of uh, virtual beings, um, we see in Black Mirror a range of ways in which that can be instantiated. So on the one hand, we have um, completely non-player characters who aren't based on anyone real, but we also have um, what Molly Gardner and Robert Sloan call in their chapter on personal identity in the book, um, avatars versus mind models. And I think that's a really important aspect too, which is that we have um, players that are avatars, so they are controlled by a human body, but they don't necessarily have the same relationship to our body as uh, like to us as our own bodies do. For example, their pain is perhaps felt, but their damage that they sustain is not felt by our physical body. Um, but we also then have um, mind models. So there's these virtual representations of real people. And we might think like how we treat each of these different kinds of entities, non-player characters, avatars, and mind models may also differ. Um, 
So we can imagine that when we see uh, in the real world um, games in which various women in the public eye are have you know um, cartoons made of them where you can beat them up. Now, on the one hand, we might say games in which you can beat up non-player characters is one thing, but having a representation of a real person where you direct those actions to may be a different thing entirely. And that's, of course, leaving aside the question of consciousness. Uh, Robert, you wanted to add something there? Yeah, I'll pile on. Um, you know, the, the other thing to think about is um, how we, in the real world, interact with these things in, as groups. So. You might have, you know, one person interacting with a single virtual entity, um, but I know that you have lots of people in the real world inter interacting with a single entity. And, uh, you know, it came up in the previous discussion, you know, um, like, what do you want to do this afternoon? I don't know, let's go kill somebody, right? We'll go play a video game where we can do these things. And what does it do to those human relationships when the relationships together, the, the friendship is built around things that they might not do in the real world. Now, you might be projecting it onto a uh, just a screen, but I, I do wonder how does it uh, create bonds among the friends? You know, that that's, uh, pops into my head. Thank you. I, I, I've got a, a follow-up question I'd like to throw to people regarding this, which is, uh, whether there might be a positive side to this. There are an awful lot of lonely people in the world. Uh, might we be overlooking something uh, potentially positive here in focusing so much on uh, the potential dangers? We could uh, give comfort to the lonely with machines that want to give these lonely people exactly what they, uh, they want to get, so the machine gets to be happy too. Yeah, so... Yeah, actually, I have something to say that I want to direct the question to, to, to David and, and, uh, and Bertha. Um, so I wasn't actually thinking along your lines, but like a lot of the best friends I have in the world, I got playing Duke Nukem or, you know, uh, like, uh, and we were on college campuses and we were uh, doing that right uh, remotely and stuff like that, but like huge camaraderie, uh, killing, yes. killing each other and killing, right? Uh, and but just today my son was upset because he was getting play he was getting killed in Fortnite too often uh, and a friend of his kept killing him right and so it can have those negative effects as well right so i, I so i want to expand the question uh uh to our two other panelists that haven't got to talk yet um bertha i want to ask you about whether or not um you think that our interactions in video games uh can lead to dehumanization in the way that we see the mass device do uh, and then I'd like David to speak about like um, what Greg was talking about, like if we have, uh, if we end up with robots one day that behave like us, what kind of ethical considerations in regard to their consciousness and that kind of stuff. So I'll go to Bertha first and, and, then, and then David. So this whole conversation reminds me of um, what Plato and Aristotle said about the arts, right? Because it's like video games is, is, mod is a modern day art form. And uh, how Plato was all about censoring the, the art that, that is you know, likely to teach our children how to kill, for example. Uh, and Aristotle uh, didn't go so far into the censorship, but still thought that, that young minds needed to have art, so, uh, art filtered. Um, I wrote a paper once a long time ago about um, Aristotle and Jersey Shore. And what is it that the, uh, there was a study that done that children, that teenagers that watch uh, MTV reality shows unsupervised are, are more likely to be sexually active at a younger age. Um, so all of this seems to me to come together and saying that if we treat video games like a modern day version of art, that uh, either some censorship might be in order or at least uh, filtering how much kids get access to these types of games. Um, and then I, I also think about what Kant said about animals, that the more likely, you, the, the more likely you're cruel to animals, the more likely you are to be cruel to persons. Um, and so all of this, I think, if, you're, if, you, if you continually kill and dehumanize someone in the game world, I think it finagles your brain in such a way that you're more likely to do it in the real world. Yeah, that's something that uh, I think comes up in uh, the, the chapter on USS Callister. Um, because uh, it, the, the kind of one of the primary questions in that, in that chapter is how should we behave in video games? 
Uh, and is there something ethically wrong, even if the, the creatures that we're interacting with aren't conscious, is there something ethically wrong with that? Or might it reveal something about ourselves, even if it's not unethical, maybe it reveals something about ourselves if we misbehave in video games willfully, right? Um, but to pull another question that came over from Robert's uh, 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 talk before, um, the question was about like cookies, right? Like uh, uh, if we one day have cookies that can do all of our dirty work for us, would it be ethical to do that? Um, and essentially the, the, the central question is, would they be conscious, right? So um, David, you can, you can speak to that and Claire can also speak to that after you're done as well, um, but go ahead. Yeah, so I was gonna follow up on what Claire was saying actually, because obviously within the virtual context at the moment, you always have this thing that, well, it's just a simulation, it's not real, right? So the, there's no ethical question about, you know, killing animals in Minecraft or whatever, right? But, um, but that's what's nice about Black Mirror, that it blurs that, that boundary, right? So in the video game, you know, now you can kill real people, people, actual consciousnesses, it's almost like snuff, right? So, so in a way, it's, uh, it's bringing the real into the video game once you've got consciousness involved, I guess. Right. Um, that's what I was, that's the main thing I was going to be tired because it's late. <laughs> <laughs> what, what time is it where you're at? A half turn or something, yeah. It's been a big day. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so yeah, the, the conscious thing is obviously, and then you've got things like the um, Black Museum, right? Where it's, you know, they're actually torturing a real, it, it's like, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's an actual consciousness kind of thing. Right. Um, and then obviously in the, uh, the one in the afterlife, whatever that was called, again, the Black Mirror frames that as, you know, them being real and having sort of real rights and, you know, being really alive, so to speak. So, um, so, so, and I imagine, you know, Black Mirror hasn't done an episode on this yet, but they probably will at some point. That there'll be some, you know, the people will eventually be able to do that kind of stuff like they do in the Black Mirror Museum, where they have some kind of snuff, right? Where the video games isn't about, you know, killing something that isn't real anymore, but you're killing something that is real in a, in a video game that then can be rebooted and re-killed and, you know, right. and actually stuff that's coming. Yeah. Claire, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just that um, partly it is how we treat these things that matters. So um, if you take, for example, the uh, Black Museum, we have to ask why did the people go to electrocute the um, synaptic snapshot of uh, of the guy who is who is in prison um, in part is because they were treating him as if he were real and we also therefore have to look and see how they are how they're um, treating them versus say a video game in which people are going into it treating them as if they were unreal though we then have to worry as Beth was saying about dehumanization in those scenarios um, but I think striking vipers is like one of the greatest episodes for showing like the double thing we have about that this it's a perfect illustration of the gamers dilemma you know, they go in to beat each other up and we were perfectly fine with that because it wasn't real. But when they start having an affair together, then the questions seem to arise very naturally for us because we then treat that relationship as if it is real. Yeah. And so the question then is, is that if it is really cheating, then weren't they really beating each other up? Right. If, um, if, if virtual love is, is really love, then isn't virtual violence really violence, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and there seems to be this dichotomy that you're pointing at. Clayton Lay is the, I had to look it up, but Clayton Lay is the, is the, the name of the prisoner that gets executed. And uh, don't feel bad, like I said, I had to look it up. Um, so many characters to keep track of. But uh, there is a kind of weird dichotomy where on the one hand, it's okay because he's not real. But on the other hand, they wouldn't be so much fun if they didn't think he was real, right? And so, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, very good. Anybody else want to add anything or should we uh, go for another question? So does anyone else uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the audience, as it were, uh, have a question for us? You can just unmute yourself or type in the chat. All right, Greg, go for it. I, I'd like to ask the, uh, the other panelists uh, a question I got to ask Kyle earlier, which is, uh, which episode of Black Mirror scares you most and why? So my, my, my answer to that one is Waldo, just because I think it's so real. That, that's my answer. But what... Uh, um, Me too. I'm scared as hell of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody else have one that they think is the most uh, frightening? So not the most important. That was the question I was going to ask, but the most frightening uh, episode. You know, the episode that really scared me was Archangel. And the, uh, re the reason it scared me is because I can totally see myself being that kind of a mother. 
uh, if I could like, if I could totally see myself following my kids around and make sure that there's, of course it's to make sure that they're safe, right? But then uh, I just totally see myself as capable of what the mother did and that scared me and made me reflect on my parenting virtues. Yeah, and somebody, I, was it JJ or was it, might have been Jim, I forget who was mentioning that, how it was, it was Jim, right? He was mentioning that there's this kind of Oedip Oedip Oedipus nature of that episode, right? You end up causing the thing that you're trying to prevent, yeah. right? Uh, which is more Oedipus's father, but right. Uh, and that there's a couple of other episodes uh, that are like that, um, where, uh, you know, by like uh, in, in the entire history of you, Liam ends up causing his relationship to end by sort of trying to save it, right? Um, and, and nosedive. Uh, yeah, and nosedive, right? Absolutely, right? She's trying to cause, she's trying to prevent uh, her, you know, zero status, and she ends up causing her zero status, right? So um, there's a lot of those elements, which is fascinating to think of that there's so many episodes that follow that kind of, you end up causing what you're trying to prevent uh, uh, motif or theme. Um, uh, One of the things I think was most scary about Archangel is actually the fact that it, it demonstrated the necessity of experiencing negative events. Um, yes. And that just seems really sad, you know, um, that as, if you're a parent, then one of the things you have to consider is, is that, you know, pain and suffering and violence and things may actually be a really important aspect um, yeah. of education. This morning when my seven-year-old was crying because his, you know, one of his friends kept killing him on, on uh, you know, on the... Uh, uh, I just I said the name a while ago and Fortnite. Fortnite, Fortnite, right? Like I was I was he was crying like he was he was he seems like seven years old like he just you know he would spawn two seconds he's dead again right and he just oh, he was getting so frustrated and I you know I kind of said yep that's some people are jerks like <laughs> that's the way that they go and that's you're gonna have to learn that if you're gonna play online you got you're gonna have to learn that people are jerks like that sometimes uh, and it was hard because he was crying um, but uh, anybody else uh, what, what's the most frightening episode to you? I mean, speaking for myself, I mean, I, I don't think any of them are really frightening. They're just, you know, little peeks into possible futures, right? I mean, yeah, maybe I'm just a sociopath or something. <laughs> 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 they sort of reveal as much about human nature as they do about technology, right? And so, yeah. in a way, you know, that we'd sort of fall into those kind of traps these days, right? Even without all the technology, technology is sort of absolutely sort of magnifying sort of distortion kind of lens on it, right? So yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's scary now. It'll be scary in the future, right? And yeah, absolutely. But, say, but don't you find that more scary that like we don't need any of this technology to reflect on the fact that this is just aspects of our humanity right now? I think you know maybe I'm at an acceptance phase rather than a. You know, it's like, you know, we've been hitting each other with swords and guns and all that for the last 10,000 years or a million years. I mean, it's just going to go on, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's certainly not new vices, but perhaps uh, new opportunities to uh, <laughs> expose old vices. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's when I did my, my talk earlier. That's how I talk about it as a technology, as a magnifying glass that magnifies those human foibles. And, and that's the ones that maybe I think that we think are so scary is that when, like, like, with, like Bertha was saying, when we see it, when we see the foible and we see it in ourselves, right? And think, whoop, uh, I better be careful, right? This is pointing out something about me that I need to be aware of uh, and try to guard against, right? And then you worry that by guarding against it, maybe you'll cause it. So Robert, do you have something to add? Yeah, I I um I thought that not one episode in particular that was scariest, but there was this theme that appeared in several episodes: white bear, shut up and dance, um, hated in the nation, where rather than abusing the virtual person, they're abusing real people, um, which you know, and it, and it, it does it so well in in white bear where you see the crowd of people getting off on the the abuse of of this person who turns out to be pretty despicable um and the cheering that goes on with the the way that they uh they have the the pedophiles kill each other and shut up and dance it becomes a sport and we take pleasure in it and and i think it's scary because that is still here you know there's there's plenty of places where we we take pleasure in watching other people destroy one another and it's, it's real and um, it, it's enabled by the technologies in, in, in the show, but it's getting to something yeah, that is ancient and David says, and we've been stabbing each other with swords. Um, well, now we're watching it uh, through cams, you know, and, and that's murder, you know, and uh, um, 
but I could extend it to something more familiar, right? Um, and accessible with uh, what I see as some pretty degrading porn, right? I mean, the accessibility, it's not your dad's playboy. It is this, you know, the kind of stuff that can uh, cause a lot of damage to the person in the film um, who you forget is a real person. So, you know, I think that they, uh, that that is what is scary to me because it is already happening. It's just, it just presents it in such a uh, stark, uh, dramatic fashion. Well said, well said. Um, any, other, any other questions from the gallery? Any other questions from the panelists? Do you have one, Rob? I, I, have a, I have a question. This is speculative, but Black Mirror is a speculative show. And you showed in your, your presentation, Kyle, um, that there is no season six, or it's we're living through season six. But I'm curious, you know, if, if we could pretend to be script writers, like, what is the next avenue that the show needs to, to look at? You know, um, it keeps returning to certain kind of themes and, and you know, ideas, but I wonder if you were to extend the show, if we were to kind of feed ideas, what, where does it go next? How can it better itself? It's already so good. A great question. I mean, Our question. I mean, it's already been patterns that are repeating perhaps a bit too much in some of the episodes, right? It's, it's tricky for them to not just go back to, you know, contact lenses doing this consciousness, right? Whatever. So uh, I think that's a really hard and important question because uh, it's, it's, it is tricky to think, you know, what they haven't mapped because they're mapping out the near future, right? They're not, and, and, that, and that's the cleverness of it, that it, it's going into stuff you could almost already build or you can already build some of the stuff. Um, so yeah, the question is, have they mined that to exhaustion or is there a, and I don't know. I mean, Maybe, maybe three things occur to me in, in particular off the top of my head. Um, one, one feature I would have liked to have seen explored more in Nosedive is how this sort of voting up, voting down system becomes organized and politicized, mm -hmm. right? It's not just going to be individuals commenting on other individuals. If you vote me down, I'm going to want to vote you down. And I'm going to want to be organized with mates of mine so that if you vote me down, we can all vote you down. And if we don't like your politics, we're all going to get together and vote you down. So I would certainly like to see that explored more. I would like to see more exploration of AI that isn't obviously of human levels of consciousness. When they bring AI into the show and have characters, even characters wonder whether they can really feel or not, um, it tends to be very sophisticated AI of about our level. Um, whereas the earliest AIs we're likely to be interacting with are, are not going to be, are going to be a lot different from us, I think. And I would like to see that explored more. Finally, um, we've been talking about uh, made to order personalities uh, to please people. I'd like them to explore the idea of our ethical relationships in an episode where the artificial person is not shown to be unhappy. So, make the artificial person a person who ought to raise all those questions about uh, what appropriate treatment, but instead of having it not work for the artificial person, yeah, okay, let them be happy. They, they like getting the coffee and mopping the floor and talking about whatever you want to talk about. Um, is it still wrong? And if so, why? I'd really like to see that explored. So th those are three places I'd like to see it go. I mean, isn't Ashley happy? Or Ash or whatever? The, the guy is like rebuilt to, to, well, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. He's he's kind of happy, right? He's okay. Uh, he he is he is mostly actually. That's that's true. Um, he becomes unhappy because because she's unhappy. Yes. He's quite stoic. Okay. Right? That's, that's a good point. <laughs> um, yes. No. That, that 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 is a good point. Um, the episode doesn't focus so much on, on problems uh, that might be inherent to the relationship, even if he's happy and maybe even if she's happy. It gets immediately into dysfunction with her. She's not happy um, because it's not really the person. So I think you're right. And I think it, it's good they explored that. I'd like to see them explore it a bit more. No, no, I agree. I'm not, I'm not denying it. I was just, you know, it's possible. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't, yes, okay. yes. Right. I, I think that um, given 
COVID then, and the disruption that that has created to the international scene, I would love for more kind of geopolitical issues to be raised in it. For example, issues of um, both colonialism, but also kind of the rise of both nationalism, but also like the fact of, of the global connectedness of people. Like how we're coping now while that connectedness has been disrupted, I think it's been really interesting. And that will hopefully give kind of grist to the mill for Black Mirror's future episodes. Actually, um, it, uh, thinking about it, I don't, th correct me if I'm wrong, but there's almost no biotechnology in Black Mirror, right? It's all machines and AIs and robots, right? So there's almost no exploration of possible genetic modifications or implications about that. And that's, that's like an absolute massive area. Yeah. I thought eugenics was a was an area waiting to be uh, tapped, as in a lot of other sci-fi. But I'd be curious to see what Brooker does with it. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I have to leave. Sorry, people. Thanks. Thanks, thanks. for joining us, Rob. Take yeah, care. Take care. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to read uh, something that Brooker said when he was asked about Chapter Six, uh, and this was uh, back in March, April, after the pandemic had hit in, uh, and basically he says. Um, I've been busy doing things. I don't know what I can say about what I'm doing and doing. At the moment, I don't know what stomach there would be for stories about societies falling apart. So I'm not working uh, anyway on one of those. I'm sort of keen on revisiting my comic skill set. So I've been writing scripts aimed at making myself laugh. So there is something like it is a little a Black Mirror, a new Black Mirror episode in the middle of a pandemic almost doesn't make sense because um, it does seem that we're we are living in it. This is something that I showed in my uh, in my in my presentation. Where uh, let me let me find it here real quick. Um, I will share this uh, if I can if I can do this right really quick. Can I share my screen? Here we go. Uh, there we go. And current slide. So this is an actual. Oops. Go back one. There. We go. <laughs> There we go. This is an actual. This is an actual advertisement, not a real advertisement for Black Mirror, but it actually appeared in Madrid, Spain, where somebody had rented some ad space and made this faux advertisement for Black Mirror, where it's the mirror is not black anymore. It's just a mirror, so you're just looking at yourself, and you're living in Black Mirror season six, sucker. Like that's that's just what's going on, and it, there's a certain in a certain kind of way, and I'm not exactly sure how to articulate why. It almost doesn't make sense to, to make another Black Mirror in, in the middle of uh, of something in the middle of the world that we're living in right now. Um, but um, although, although there is all this technology with contact tracing and you know it's all kinds of horrible stuff that could go wrong in difficult ways. <laughs> in a way, it, you you can see it, it'd be quite good to dramatize that and you know you know show some of the angles on that. I think. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like it gives us a whole bunch of fodder to work with, right? I guess what I'm, maybe I'm thinking like the feeling of it changes or something. Like I'm, I'm not even sure how to articulate it, but um, uh, we had another question from the, from the gallery where Jen asked, if someone were to start watching Black Mirror, which episode would you suggest they start with? Would it make sense to start at the beginning or with an episode less intense? Uh, so I'll say what I always say on this. I don't know what episode to start with. All I know is don't start with the first one. It is too intense. Too many people watch it and say, I'm not going to watch anything else because um, uh, it, it, it sets a tone uh, in a way that they don't like. Um, Bertha, do you have uh, a suggestion about like what's the best episode maybe uh, to start with when it, when it comes to starting with Black Mirror? Um, the first episode I ever saw was White Bear. Uh, so I'm not sure that's a pretty intense episode. I can tell you that after watching Shut Up and Dance, I had to take a long break from Black Mirror. Uh -huh. um, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't continue handling the emotions that was present in me. So don't start with Shut Up and Dance. Um, I, like, I like White Bear just because of it, uh, all the social commentary. And I guess I, I concentrated more on that than, but it, it is still, I mean, aren't, aren't they all pretty intense? I mean, most of them. I think USS Callister might be one that's not as intense. Maybe. And the one about, I forgot the name, the one about the, oh my gosh, the, the two women that, that were in the virtual reality. Benjamin Carey. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. You can start with that one, although I think that one might be better as a, as a palate cleanser after Shut Up and Dance. Something <laughs> nice and light. I mean, personally, I love the first episode. That's convinced me I should watch more, right? <laughs> it's absolutely superb. Um, but I mean, but my, my take would be White Christmas, right? Because I think that's a very clever episode that draws in a lot of the themes of consciousness and it's not, you know, particularly, you know, nasty, right? But it's, it's, it's clever. 
uh, and it's layered and it's got lots of stuff in it. So that, that'd be my pick. Yeah, that's a good one. I always recommend that people should start with the first one. I think it hits all the right notes. Like it's, it's about um, spectacle. Um, and I like the fact that uh, it's slightly traumatizing. I think that if you go into the other one spawning something that's not traumatizing, maybe it's just the wrong kind of show. And, and I love, I actually, one of the things I really love about it is it doesn't involve any new technology. And so yeah. while it's easy to watch the other episodes and be distracted by the idea that, oh, if someone made that, then we'd have a problem. The first episode really highlights that the problems all lie with us, that it's not the technology sport. Um, yeah. And it doesn't distract us from that fact. Yeah, I think that, that's absolutely that's absolutely dead on. The reason I usually say not is because I'm trying to get people to watch the whole series. And I've heard too many people say, I watched the first one, then I stopped. Um, but but maybe it's the kind of thing like, well, then it's not for you, right? Like I shouldn't be like m making people watch Black Mirror if they're not made for it. Maybe that's the right word. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. What, what does anybody else think? I love Nose. So I, I love the, the first episode personally, and it, it really hooked me on the series. Um, but depending on the person, it might not be the one I first recommend. I think Nosedive is very accessible. Uh, I think a lot of people are sensitive to the sorts of issues it brings up in terms of social media. So that might be one to, uh, to go with if you think uh, Shut Up and Dance is a bit strong. I think that, that's, that sounds right to me. I'm having trouble uh, getting my, my, my chat to work here. So if anybody else has a question in the chat, put it in the chat or you can unmute your mic and ask it. I, I have one more comment. If, if you, um, another thought about an area I'd love to see Black Mirror go is this. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, the Western society we live in at the moment is split very much according to what media we trust. It seems to me that it's uh, political orthodoxy on, in both major camps that what divides the left and right is different values. I don't think that's true. I think above all, what divides left and right is uh, beliefs about non-moral, non-evaluative facts about uh, the world. You know, wh what would the effects of, of immigration be? How dangerous is COVID? Is the fetus a person or not? Um, and it raises the, the great question of how do we decide what information sources to trust? If you listen to Bright, or if, you, if you read Breitbartnews.com and believe everything you read, you'll get a very different picture of the world, quite apart from political principles and so forth, than you will if, if you read um, you know, something else, you know, CNN or even Fox. Uh, so I'd really like to see the show deal with that question. I think it, 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 it's a major question we face dealing with modern media. There's a lot of hogwash out there. Yeah. What are we to do? What's the poor individual to, to do? Yeah, uh, along that line, I might add that uh, one, and I, it's got to be, it's got to be a mix. It's got to be a mix of, of the two things. So you're suggesting that um, it's not a, it's a matter, it's not a matter of uh, values determining uh, this this breach, but but uh, disagreements about the facts about what's uh, about what's the case in the world, uh, right? Well, I mean, it, it is slight, it is slightly complicated. Obviously, our values might influence what facts we believe, and and vice versa. Yeah. But I think often our disagreements that both sides tend to frame as disagreements over values often the values being appealed to are the same it's it's the facts non-evaluative facts that people are, are are disagreeing on right right and then but then sometimes an episode would be really good if it shows like sometimes it's that way and then sometimes the reverse is, is true and it depends on what values you have as to what facts you believe right so um, yes right so for example if someone uh, i have a paper where i argue that uh disagreements about abortion actually don't bottom out in disagreements about whether a fetus is a person but about the but about the morality of sex and whether or not you should have to pay the consequences for the sex that you have or not and okay. what depending on what position you take on that you're more likely to think a fetus is a person because thinking a fetus is a person is a more is a very convenient way to make people pay for the consequences of the sex they have and thinking it's not as it goes the other direction right so there i think it, it definitely would go both ways and an episode that tackles that would be would be would be brilliant um, It'd be fascinating, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Any, anybody else? Any other comments on on that or anything else? We've got a question from Randy Jensen. Oh yeah, Randy, I just saw it. Uh, in thinking about the audience uh, for Black Mirror, I wonder if it appeals to folks of a particular political persuasion, 
or if it appeals to people who enjoy philosophy or any ideas. So yeah, so that's a really good. Does it appeal to a particular person? Uh, political persuasion, just people who like philosophy, people who like really dark, uh, uh, you know, weird shows. What, what, what do you guys think? I'll pick on Claire. Claire, what do you think about that? Um, there's something slightly, I think, masochistic about watching Black Mirror. And I wonder if you do have to be a, a certain kind of person to enjoy it. I think Charlie Brooker said that um, watching an episode is a bit like being hit by a car. And the fact that we turn up again and again to be hit by a car, um, I think says maybe more about our humanity than maybe Black Mirror ever could. Um, but I, I, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of sci-fi. Um, and it's very, very hard not to then spend at least half an hour after watching an episode puzzling over something. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it's very unpredictable helps, um, but the fact that it's not about kind of far-flung futures, I think is also really important. So I think it's one of the greatest tools that philosophers have been given to introduce other people to important philosophical notions, whether that's what they intended or not. It makes you a philosopher, even if perhaps you're not a philosopher going in. Yeah, it forces you to do it. That's what my students are finding out, is it forces you to do philosophy. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're talking about the class, but they're also talking about the show when after every, you know, after, after class, they're always going, man, this makes you think. It makes you think really hard, makes you think too much. Like, that's what it's, that's what it's supposed to do. Um, Bertha, do you have, you have thoughts on this? What kind of crack person do you have to be to, to watch Black Mirror? I'm actually curious what uh, class you are using this for. Like, you keep talking about your students. What class is this? Oh, uh, at King's, uh, there were, all students are required to take two philosophy classes, an intro class, and then a second philosophy class. That second philosophy class could be an ethics class. It can be a logic class. It can be a, a philosophy of religion class. I teach a pop culture and philosophy class okay. uh, where I simply use pop culture to introduce the students to philosophical arguments and themes and, and ideas and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I've taught different varieties of it. Um, I've taught a version on Star Trek only. I've taught a, a version on uh, Simpsons and South Park. Uh, I've taught a one that's a whole bunch of different Simpsons, South Park, Star Trek, uh, House MD, uh, all different kinds of stuff. Um, I have one based on my great courses course called Sci-Fi Science Fiction as Philosophy. I have that. Um, but this semester and last semester, I've taught a version that's based solely on, on the book. Um, and so I have the uh, students, essentially what we do is an assignment is to go and watch an episode. We come to class and talk about it. We try to identify the philosophical themes and the, um, the morals and all that kind of stuff. They go and read, they go and read a chapter. We come back and talk about that and we go back and forth. Um, and, uh, and then they write a, a paper on the end, essentially about an episode that we haven't watched using some of the philosophy that we learned, uh, over the semester. So that's, that the, sounds like fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. The, the students, yeah. uh, the students like it and it's not as easy as they think it is. They come in to kind of think it's going to be easy and it's not easy. Um, so, um, yeah, and it's, I've, I'm teaching for the second time this semester, uh, and it's going pretty well so far. Masks and all, like, I mean, completely in person. Everybody's wearing a mask at King's College, though, and uh, everything seems to be going well. And, um, yeah, they're, I'm teaching three sections of it, and they're all filled up, so I got 75 students doing this um, this semester, and it's going great. To answer your question, I really think that you need to be, in order to really appreciate how, how, what these episodes can do, you need to be the kind of person that is that it wants and is capable of really of self-reflection mm. like most of these episodes really made me think about who i am as a person am i you know what i what i, what I would do as a mother or what do i do when um do, do, is what happened in white mirror revenge or justice and what does it say about about me that i that you know uh, so if um i think self uh, self -introspe introspection uh if you is important to really appreciate these episodes. Yeah, good. David, you got thoughts on this? Oh, really? Um, I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of a self-selection thing, isn't it, I suppose? I mean, I imagine it's sort of fairly middle class, fairly <laughs> liberal sort of oriented people is my guess. I imagine if you're, you know, extremely religious in some form or another, then probably it's a fairly godless show, right? It's, it's so, I, I imagine that's more the, you know, demographic that it draws on, but that's just a very loose, you know. That makes sense. Greg? I imagine that it appeals more to young people, though I haven't actually looked at the research regarding who's watching it. It's going to help a lot if you're a little bit hip to technology. 
Um, so I'm going to guess that the audience swings left, but I really don't know. It is a show that ought to be of interest to everybody. Um, and there have been some great science fiction writers who've been conservatives. So presumably a lot of great science fiction readers have been conservatives too. Um, I'm imagining the audience to be mostly liberal, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure myself. I, I, I kind of have the same suspicions, but, uh, but I'm not sure. So we're almost out of time. Let's finish up with one last question with a short answer from everyone. Uh, and uh, it'll be the question I was going to sort of ask to begin with, but uh, I'll give it a shorter answer. So I'm going to be asking you, what do you think the most important episode is? And by that, I basically mean um, if somebody came to you and they could only watch one episode of Black Mirror, which one, which one would it, would it be? Uh, so I'm going to go in order on my screen. So well, well, Greg just talked, so I'll go actually reverse. Bertha, uh, you first. Uh, most important episode, you think? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, uh, probably white bear. Okay. Um, because I think we're in our in our in our society of reality shows, uh, and us being voyeuristic and peeking in and taking pleasure out of other people's misery, uh, and and this in particular, I think questions about justice versus uh, revenge. And what that says about the, that we enjoy the revenge, what that says about us as a society. Um, so I could ask me that because it was the first episode I saw, I'm partial to it, but it's definitely the, the episode that had a profound effect on me. David? Um, okay, so I'm going to pick three because, you know, pretty outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, first one I'm going to pick is Nosedive. Um, you know, the reason I'm going to pick Nosedive is because. It's buildable now, so I've actually, you know, with some of my, I'm going to get one of my students to build it, you know, either, you know, when I when I find one who's good enough. But you know, it's doable now, so it's kind of dramatizing rather than a lot of the other episodes are based on technology that we may or may not, we may never have, right? You can sort of see that, you know, maybe we could have a whole brain emulation that has it into sort of virtual paradise or something. But you know, that's that's way way far ahead but those divers doable now so it raises a lot of interesting issues and also um be right back the ashley one um that's also buildable now you know there's people reconstructing people with chatbots and that kind of stuff so i like the ones that are really you know dramatizing things now um in terms of sort of more my own sort of research i like i mean i didn't think black, black museum was a particularly good episode it, i sort of watched it and felt well look they've just rehacked all the same sort of stuff but it's it's a good episode because it does show you how consciousness technology is likely to evolve over time. And so I, I liked its story it told about the possible scientific journey that we're going to take with that. You know, and it also threw in the bad stuff about torturing consciousness and all that, but it had a sort of semi-realistic start with this sort of feed, empathy feeling thing. And then you had toys as consciousness. And, you know, I like that. I didn't think it's a good episode, but, um, but as, as to return again to, you know, White Christmas, I think that's, that's definitely the one that, you know, I personally think, you know, is the best and that I personally, one of my personal favorites anyway. And that's, the question was, which would I recommend? Or was that, that it? Yeah, like if they had to watch one, which one would you if say? They had to watch one again, because that's, it brings all the themes together. And it's got, and it's also nice because it's uh, not only does it have this sort of layered structure, but it also has some things that are sort of way ahead, like the whole cookie thing and the automation thing, which again, it's not that far in terms of, again, I've been trying to get some of my students to build these sort of more copies of people's personalities as a personal assistants, rather than these chatbots that are more like Alexa, where they're sort of hard coded, but they're trying to more, more personalize personal assistants without the consciousness, right? But also then it's got that whole nice blocking technology, which is also, I've been thinking about whether we could actually build that and that's, that's kind of nice, right? So that's, we haven't got the contact lenses, right? But you could in theory, um, block someone in their email communications and even block them on the audio, right? Speech recognition is getting, getting good enough for that. So, yeah. so that's got both the realism, but also quite some quite profound stuff about questions. Yeah, nice, nice. Claire? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> it seems controversial for, for the panel, but I still think that uh, the first episode, National Anthem, is one of the most important. Um, I think it demonstrates very well how, yeah, we use uh, horror has become a spectacle, um, but it also highlights the fact that our understanding of the world has to be filtered through our attention and what our attention blinds us to. So, um, you know, at the end of the episode, of course, then um, 
because everyone is watching the prime minister with the pig, no one realizes the princess has already been released and the whole whole thing was completely unnecessary. And so, yeah, it demonstrates the, the fact that um, technology can, can keep us blind, well, we keep ourselves blind to certain aspects of the world because our attention is limited and we live in an attention economy. Um, on that note, I think, you know, as you say, it is hard to watch and that, um, that we have to remind ourselves to see past the horror to kind of get to, I think, what the underlying message of the episode is. But if I was going to be kind and recommend an episode that wasn't quite so traumatizing, then probably Smithereens, because I think it, had, it deals with a lot of similar issues. Um, it doesn't involve any new technology. It's a very human story. And um, perhaps it will actually have genuinely good benefits and encourage people to turn off notifications. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not get so distracted yes yes um i have uh I'll, the mo most of mine were off beforehand but i turned off the rest of them like any other kind of notifications or whatever turned them off after that episode i don't think i would disagree with you if i'm going to have somebody who's going to watch a bunch of black mirror i might still suggest they skip the first episode just because i want to watch them more but if they're just going to watch one watch the first episode right like yeah you know, yeah i think i think that that seems right uh, so greg last word and then we're going to get to the trivia here here in a minute Lovely. I'm, I'm going to go for the Waldo moment. Like a lot of people, I wasn't that impressed with it the first time it came out. It all seemed a bit silly. Since then, with the development of political events, I don't think it's silly anymore. And uh, uh, I think the issue of disrespect in, in politics, the world just could hang on this one. So I think it's, I think it's really, really important, very timely, the Waldo moment. Yeah, yeah. I think that might, that might be... In regards to the most important one, I think that's what I think that's what I would say. Although that first episode is anyway, it's uh, a beauty. The first episode too, I love it. Yeah. So, uh, so it looks like we're out of time. I cannot express enough thanks uh, to you, uh, not only for being on the panel today and taking the time to be on the panel uh, with me today, but all of the hard work that you put into the book, putting up with me as the editor, and all the unreasonable demands I made of you. Um, I think the product turned out pretty good in the end. Uh, so I think I'm glad that I was, uh, that I did what I did, but I know that it couldn't have been easy always dealing with me. So thank you so much for all your hard work and your patience. Um, I'm just so proud of the book, uh, uh, the end result. I, it's just, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, again, thanks for being on the panel. And uh, I'm going to hit stop on record. And thanks for everybody in the audience and for all of your questions. And if you stick around, I've got an hour's worth of uh, Black Mirror trivia that we're going to do that I think will be a lot of fun. So, and panelists, feel free to stick around for that. So, thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Carl.